morning all i dr prajakta sahasra budde would like to welcome all the delegates to our first invited talk cardiac rehabilitation in home are we really doing enough to chair this session i would like to request dr razia nagarwala who is head of the department cardiovascular and pulmonary physiotherapy in sanchedi college of physiotherapy razia ma'am is a senior and respected faculty in the field of Uh, physiotherapy education with numerous publications on her name over to you ma'am it gives me immense pleasure to introduce dr shweta gore well she was a lecturer at sanjeeti institute college of physiotherapy india in 2007 to 2010 during her tenure at sicop she was organizing secretary of scientifica in 2009 and 2010 and well it was her brain child with her other colleagues to start with the student forum which we are still going on with lots of fun for the students in present dr shweta is working as associate professor in physical therapy at mgm mgh institute of health profession boston usa She did her PhD in physical therapy from University of Michigan and doctor in physical therapy from Michigan University. She has completed her master in physical therapy in intensive care and cardiopulmonary science from Manipal University India and her bachelor of physical therapy from Devi Ahilya Vishwavidyalaya University India. She is a board certified geriatric clinical specialist by the American Board of Physical Therapy Specialties and a certified lymphedema therapist. Dr. Gore has worked in a variety of clinical settings and her primary clinical interests are in cardiovascular and pulmonary physical therapy in acute and critical care. She also teaches cardiovascular and pulmonary physical therapy and critical care management courses. to doctor of physical therapy student at mgh boston usa she has many awards and honors she has a keen interest in research and is reflected by her work she has received several grants to work with a large national data sets to few, mention few learning health system rehabilitation research network mgh MGH Institute of Health Profession for COVID Research, American Physical Therapy Association for Clinical Practice Guideline on the Immediate Post Acute Care. She has several publication. She has also presented her work in numerous national and international conferences. To mention, she has done some thirty-two professional presentation. Well done, Shweta. She is a co-leader of APTA Clinical Practice Guidelines Committee and member of the Specialization Academy of Content Experts in Geriatrics. She has reviewed many journals: Journal of Physical, Journal of, Physical Medicine, Medicine, Journal of COPD, Archives of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, Hong Kong Journal of Physical Therapy, Respiratory Care. Today, Dr. Shweta will be speaking for cardiac rehab at home setting. Are we doing enough? So, I give it to Dr. Shweta Gore to start with her talk today, and I welcome Dr. Shweta Gore again. Thank you, ma'am, for this kind introduction. Uh, Scientifica is very close to my heart, uh, and I have very fond memories of Scientifica, and I'm so proud to see that it is. reached a national level and such recognition so i'm honored to be here today with everyone and i will be um talking about cardiac rehab in the home setting are we doing enough uh, i wanted to take a minute to um acknowledge my collaborators dr sherry pinkstaff from uh, university of north florida and dr claire child from university of washington seattle um So uh let me just yeah okay so today I'll be talking about uh, different trends in cardiovascular disease and then cover traditional and non-traditional cardiac rehab uh settings and talk about some simple ways uh of exercise testing and uh prescription in the home settings 
So coming to the trends in cardiovascular disease, as we probably already know, cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death globally and in the United States, accounting for one in four deaths. And if you look at uh, this uh, figure right here, uh, where the left side is the race or ethnic groups and the right side is percentage of deaths in men and women. You'll see that the deaths are pretty even across men, women and people of most racial ethnic groups. So it evenly impacts everyone. Um, when, as, uh, when we look at um, myocardial infarction, every year more than 800,000 people just in the U.S. experience a myocardial infarction and one out of these one out of five of these is a silent mi in terms of disability cardiovascular disease is again one of the leading contributors to the global burden of disability contributing to over 30 percent of the total disability burden and obviously all of this comes down to the cost of care right so it impacts the cost of care and if we look at us alone 363 billion dollars were spent in 2016 and 2017 in healthcare costs that were directly associated with cardiovascular disease so cardiovascular disease obviously has a huge impact on on healthcare and when we look at our traditional center-based outpatient cardiac rehab, um, it is the single most comprehensive, evidence-based and cost-effective non-invasive intervention to improve outcomes in patients with cardiac events and surgeries. And this, I'm not saying this um, on my own, this has been endorsed by American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology, and American Association of Cardiovascular and Pulmonary Rehab. Uh, so when we look at the evidence on the effectiveness of cardiac rehab on outcomes, we have very convincing data that it actually does work. So if you look at risk of recurrence of MI, um, on the left side, it favors um, cardiac rehab and the right side favors does not favor cardiac rehab. So this is a, a meta-analysis which was published very recently. Um, compiling all the high quality randomized control trials. And you can see that cardiac rehab has a very strong effect to reduce the risk of recurrence of MI with a risk ratio of 0.42, meaning that cardiac rehab can decrease the risk of a new myocardial infarction by 58%. Similarly, for mortality, um, cardiac rehab can significantly reduce the risk of dying by 41% and reduce the risk of hospital admissions by 18%. Now, these are all very tangible outcomes that are directly related to the cost. But even for other outcomes such as aerobic capacity, we have a very recent um, uh, meta-analysis that was done from compiling results of all high-quality randomized control trials. And on the left side, you can see that it favors decreasing or decreased VO2 peak. And on the right side, it favors increased uh, VO2 peak. So again, participation in cardiac rehab has a very strong effect towards improving aerobic capacity, significant improvement in aerobic capacity by participating in cardiac rehab. Uh, and we already know that not just aerobic capacity, cardiac rehab has shown to improve overall physical function, quality of life, mental health, as well as inflammatory markers and uh, physical activity behaviors. So in line with all of this uh, evidence, cardiac rehab has a class one indication, which is the highest level of evidence that there can be for qualifying diagnosis. So diagnoses that are qualified to receive cardiac rehab include heart failure, myocardial infarction, coronary interventions, as well as stable angina and peripheral arterial disease. So the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology recommend referral to cardiac rehab as one out of nine performance measures, meaning that cardiac rehab is identified as one out of nine relevant dimensions of care that should be evaluated for secondary prevention of major cardiac events and surgeries. So to improve, so just like uh, patients who go for who go to the hospital for a total knee replacement or a total uh, hip replacement, 
where while they are in the hospital and before they get discharged, they already have referral to home physical therapy or outpatient physiotherapy already lined up for them. Um, the ACVPR and AHA have recommended a similar model for patients uh, who are admitted to the hospital for cardiovascular disease. So they say that before they get discharged, they should already have a referral to outpatient cardiac rehab. And I think some hospitals already have this uh, package deal where, uh, where, where patients, once they enter uh, uh, the hospital, for a cardiac diagnosis that they get cardiac rehab uh, as part of it. So those are measures to improve utilization of cardiac rehab. Unfortunately, despite the well-documented benefits of cardiac rehab, the fact remains that it is widely underutilized, not just in the US, but worldwide. And the population that is most affected are women, older adults, and people from underserved populations mainly because of problems of going to outpatient rehab centers, right? So there, these centers are mainly located uh, near major hospitals in bigger cities. So not all patients can afford to travel to these centers, say, three times a week. So those living in the suburbs or rural locations do not have easy access to these facilities. So that's where home-based cardiac rehab comes into picture. And... Um, when we look at home-based cardiac rehab, a very recent study was published um, in 2021 that looked at um, exploring barriers to participation in center-based cardiac rehab and patients' attitudes towards home-based cardiac rehab. So in this study, they identified over 2,000 patients with cardiac diagnoses, and then they found that of these 357 patients had uh, diagnoses that were eligible for uh, cardiac rehab. So these 357 patients were referred to outpatient cardiac rehab. Out of these, only 67 completed a cardiac rehab program and 290 either did not enter the program at all or they um, you know, abandoned the program halfway through. So uh, the, the authors of this study, they sent out a, a, a survey to these 290 uh, patients who never went to cardiac rehab. Um, and the survey asked them about their you know, beliefs around uh, center-based cardiac rehab, the challenges of why they couldn't go, and their attitudes towards home-based cardiac rehab. So while these patients, they thought that home-based cardiac rehab had obvious health benefits, not home-based, uh, center-based cardiac rehab had uh, obvious health benefits. They thought that home-based cardiac rehab could have accelerated their treatment. It was more convenient. It offered cost reduction and it saved time and reduced stress and conformed better to their life and work. So they mentioned that, you know, if it was home-based cardiac rehab, they would have participated in that whole uh, program. So clearly you can see that uh, there is this value of home-based cardiac rehab. Uh, and ca home-based cardiac rehab is not really new. It has been evaluated against traditional center-based cardiac rehab in several studies looking at different parameters such as safety, mortality, excess capacity, etc. And when we look at safety, safety is one of the biggest concerns when it comes to um, you know, seeing patients within these home settings, right? So uh, in this uh, safety parameter, there were many studies that compared um, home-based cardiac rehab and um, center-based cardiac rehab to see if home-based cardiac rehab was safe. So they found that uh, for the low to moderate risk clients, it is uh, safe to say that patients can be seen in the home-based cardiac rehab settings. However, none of the home-based cardiac uh, rehab studies included any patients uh, that had higher that were of higher risk category. So at this point, we can't really say um, uh, with confidence that home home based cardiac rehab is safe for the higher risk uh, category patients. In terms of mortality outcomes, uh, at least eight different studies have compared all cause mortality data for up to 12 months of intervention and have shown similar improvements with both home based and center based cardiac rehab. Similarly, for exercise uh, capacity and quality of life, 
both have shown improved outcomes with both home-based cardiac rehab as well as center-based cardiac rehab. But where home-based cardiac rehab really stands out and demonstrates a potential benefit is this area of withdrawals and adherence. So at least 14 different types of studies have compared adherence outcomes. Uh, although these studies had substantial variation in how adherence was measured in these studies, the studies that were comparable um, on graduation rates demonstrate a clear advantage of home-based cardiac rehab over center-based cardiac rehab with significantly higher graduation rates um, in home-based cardiac rehab. So given the obvious benefits of a home-based cardiac rehab on health outcomes and this gap that we need to um, bridge in the utilization of cardiac rehab, there has been a strong push within the cardiovascular medical community as well as the rehab community to improve uh, cardiac rehab, not just in the US, but across uh, countries. And uh, if you may be aware uh, of the Millions Heart Initiative, this is an initiative that has been started um, all over the world. Um, and it is to try to bridge this gap of access to cardiac rehab by uh, developing more cardiac rehab centers and where there are no, no centers trying to develop these remote or hybrid options or home-based options uh, to better um, uh, implement cardiac rehab. Uh, Millions Heart Initiative also provides a lot of um, information uh, on patient, um, you know, patient education materials. So if you are interested in, you know, providing some patient education materials, you can use this Millions Heart Initiative uh, resources that are very helpful. So the uh, American Association of Cardiovascular and Pulmonary Rehab, the American Heart Association, and the American College of Cardiology, they jointly published a scientific statement on home-based cardiac rehab. What they said was uh, that home-based cardiac rehab uh, should be similar to the uh, outpatient cardiac rehab in, in, in the sense that it, it will be interdisciplinary and it would have the same core components as the outpatient cardiac rehab. So the core components of home-based cardiac rehab would include exercise training um, with the goal to improve long-term physical activity, dietary education to induce healthy eating habits, medication management and adherence, overall smoking cessation and psychosocial assessment for stress management with these intermediate outcomes of improving exercise capacity, improving body uh, measures, improving all the risk factors such as blood pressure, blood sugar, lipid levels, and improving um, overall stress, reducing stress. And these will then improve the main outcomes, right? So your main direct, uh, in, uh, outcomes include risk of cardiovascular events, hospital admissions, mortality, adverse events, and cost of care. Now, the, this scientific statement also um, uh, established some potential advantages of home-based cardiac rehab over center-based cardiac rehab. And some of the advantages that really stand out include flexibility of scheduling appointments, overcoming some of the transportation barriers, uh, greater privacy while receiving cardiac rehab, and allowing for better integration within the regular ha uh, home environment. So obviously, with COVID pandemic, a lot of things changed really quickly for cardiac rehab. So there was already this push to improve access to cardiac rehab, but because of COVID, um, several facilities had temporary uh, had to temporarily close down, and there were very there were several challenges to maintain social distancing. So the existing facilities could not function in the way that they they could uh, previously, and therefore clinicians were forced to quickly transition to some form of home based cardiac rehab delivery. This definitely offered lots of opportunities to really explore home based cardiac rehab and improve uh, cardiac cardiac rehab in the home settings. But the question is, how do we effectively deliver cardiac rehab in the home settings? And today, I'll talk mainly on the exercise component of home-based cardiac rehab and provide some simple strategies for exercise testing and training in home settings that will serve as a good starting point um, uh, for, for your patients. 
So uh, this is again um, a graphic that was developed by the Millions Heart uh, Association and CDC. And this graphic provides a simple clinical decision-making guide on whether your patients are suitable for home-based cardiac rehab or not. So for example, if you take transportation, if the patient lives less than an hour from, from the outpatient cardiac facility, and they have transport access, then it, then they should be pushed to go to a center-based cardiac rehab because that is really um, uh, where you can provide supervised monitoring and um, uh, ECG and all of that. Uh, however, if they live over one hour away, then, then definitely home-based options can be explored. Similarly, when you look at the risk, as we know, if the patient is high risk, then they are not suitable for these home-based and hybrid options but they should be seen at the center at this time. But if they are low to moderate risk, and if it's like a heart, a stable heart failure patient on medications, and if they already have an ICD implanted, that is Im implantable cardioverter defibrillator implanted, then they are suitable to see in the home and hybrid settings. So you have to make those kinds of uh, determinations uh, when you make uh, decisions around whether your patient is suitable for uh, home-based cardiac rehab. So now moving on to exercise testing in the home settings. So although there are several purposes of exercise testing that include screening and diagnosis for cardiovascular disease, um, differentiating between cardiac and pulmonary causes of disease, and using it as a prognostic tool to measure change following intervention or rehab, the goal for exercise testing in the context of cardiac rehab is to utilize the information from exercise testing to then uh, formulate or design an exercise prescription so that we can calculate the right dosage of exercise. So your assessment is the exercise testing piece, which will guide your exercise prescription, uh, which will guide your exercise prescription. So all the benefits of a cardiac rehab that we just discussed, they can only happen if the exercise is delivered at an appropriate intensity. If the exercise testing is not used to determine exercise intensity, then the exercise prescription is not meaningful and will not translate to any real benefits. So we know that there are several available exercise tests. Um, and one of the uh, most important is the gold standard test, which is the cardiopulmonary exercise testing or CPET. This is the only direct method to obtain actual VO2 values or, or actual oxygen consumption. All the other tests are predictive assessments uh, that can predict oxygen consumption using equations. And within the predictive assessments, you have the uh, symptom limited or maximal exercise test and the submaximal exercise test. Now, submaximal exercise tests are the more commonly used tests that utilize several different endpoints. So instead of having the patient go all the way, exercise all the way out to exhaustion, the test is terminated at a predetermined endpoint, such as 85% of the age predicted heart rate max or a certain MET value or a certain RPE value. Then we have the field tests, and these are those that do not require a lab setting. Uh, so, so, so all those walk tests can fall under the field tests. So now our, the question is, what kind of tests can you do uh, or are feasible in the home settings? So obviously the, the tests that require elaborate equipment like the CPET or even uh, some of these submaximal tests that require treadmill, bicycle ergometer cannot be done within the home settings. So our options are limited to these field tests. And so we'll see some of these field tests that can be used in the home settings. So the first and by far the most popular field test is the six minute walk test, which has been recommended as a test that can be safely administered in the home setting, both in a supervised face-to-face -face, uh, manner and has also been explored in remote, remote options. Some of the advantages that six minute walk test offers includes um, excellent reliability, good responsiveness, uh, assessment of desaturation while walking, and one of the most important advantages is that it has regression equations already developed that help us design exercise prescription, which we can use to calculate exercise dosage. However, one of the biggest challenge using this test is feasibility. 
Typically, uh, six-minute walk test requires a track length of 30 meters, which is 100 feet, to allow va uh, valid results. And now, most home settings may not have this type of track length, and this might impact the validity of the results. So when we look at how we can use six-minute walk test for exercise prescription, six-minute walk test can be easily integrated to calculate intensity of exercise in several different ways. First, you can convert the distance walked uh, to a VO2 peak, predicted VO2 peak, using the regression uh, equation uh, here, which uses this total six minute walk test distance covered. Now, in order to you, and then this VO2 peak can be easily converted to heart rate. However, the most important thing for using this, this uh, equation is that six minute walk test should be administered correctly with specific instructions so that it truly elevates the heart rate. Sometimes uh, six minute walk test is delivered such that patients are just walking in the park, right? They're just strolling in the park and that doesn't really elevate their heart rate at all. So the instructions should be very specific and standardized. I want you to cover as much distance possible or as much ground possible in the six minutes such that at the end of the test, you could not have walked any longer. So even though you're not really directly talking about giving instructions about the speed, uh, it is implied when you say that by the end of the test, you could not have walked any longer. It implies that the patient needs to put their best effort, their maximum effort, so that it truly elevates their heart rate. And if that doesn't happen, if it's not really administered appropriately, then you can't use this equation to really um, uh, appropriately um, identify the exercise intensity. There are also other ways in which you can use um, six minute walk test um, to prescribe intensity, such as using percentage of the total um, you know, distance that they walked as their training intensity or a percentage of the speed that they walked as their training intensity. Now, one of the good news is that studies have compared shorter distances of 17 meters in, and, and compared those with the 30 meter traditional distance. And they found that uh, there is no difference in the distance walked between the shorter length and the and the 30 meter length, meaning that patients uh, who walk on the 17 meter track, um, they cover exactly the same distance as they would if they would walk on a 30 meter track. So which is which is very encouraging. However, this has not been validated. So we need to validate the shorter six minute walk distance uh, test. And so that is another scope for future research uh, that we can take up. Um, now, another test is the home heart walk test. The home heart walk test was adapted from the six minute walk test to improve the feasibility of testing in the home setting. So here the clients are required to walk for a full six minutes continuously on a five meter path, which is marked by a rope. And the number of laps are then counted and converted to distance. Then six minute stepper test. And six minute stepper test is another test that can be easily performed in the home setting. It aims at measuring the number of steps performed on a stepper in six minutes. So when we say a step, a step is defined as a single complete movement of raising one foot up and then bringing it back down. That whole motion is one step. And um, they use a 20 centimeter step height placed on the ground against the wall so that the patients can actually lean against the wall or put their hand on the wall for balance. Another test, which is amazing, which is a, 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 my favorite test, is the 10 meter incremental shuttle walk test. This test um, involves walking back and forth between two cones that are 10 meters apart in time to set off uh, auditory beats. So this is a very feasible test in home settings. This test can be extensively used in pulmonary population, and it is extremely useful validated submax test that can be used in the uh, home-based cardiac rehab. Uh, this test has pre-recorded audio beats that are easily available from for download from the American Thoracic Society's website. Um, and again, as I said, it has excellent reliability, validity, and responsiveness. 
uh, these are other testing resources that can be used, um, you know, uh, very easily. And um, and there's this two minute step test. Um, so the two minute step test was developed by Ricky and Jones. Again, this is a very simple test that can be used in the home settings because basically patients have to just march in place as fast as possible for two minutes while lifting their knee to a certain height, right? So they already have that pointer on the marked on the wall and they have to lift their knee to that pointer every single time for two minutes. And then you have to count the number of uh, times the um, patient raised the knee to the correct point. The problem is that uh, this can be used as a prognostic tool to see how they improve, but cannot be used to develop or design exercise intensity. Again, this is a very easy uh, test. So this is a very good area of further research if someone wants to take, uh, take on this test to develop or establish its validity. Um, so now moving on to exercise prescriptions, I'm not going to talk more on the actual intensity calculation, but more around clinical decision making using simple tools like heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate. So oftentimes you do not have access to monitoring or ECG within the patient's homes. So how can you use uh, simple tools like heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate to, uh, to make some good clinical judgments about the patient? So again, you know, this is you you prescribe an exercise after an assessment and then you your intervention, but assessment is a continual process. So even during your intervention, you are kind of looking at that um, assessment piece. So simple physiological assessments such as blood pressure, heart rate, respiratory rate, SpO2 can provide critical information to make appropriate clinical decisions about exercise in the home settings. Recording and documenting resting vital signs. That means vital signs prior to exercise as well as access, uh, as well as vital signs after exercise. This is a pretty common practice but, uh, and it is also very helpful because they are strong uh, indicators of poor health. However, what doesn't often happen is that we don't really record vital signs during exercise. That is often missed out in clinical practice. Um, although we, we teach that, it is, it's often mis missed out. And assessment of this exercise response during exercise allows for identification of physiological abnormalities that are not readily apparent during the collection of resting vitals. Therefore, recording uh, vitals during exercise helps in determining the efficiency of cardiovascular pump and activity uh, tolerance. Moreover, challenging the cardiovascular system without assessing vital signs may actually um, be harmful the, for the patient's safety. And therefore, vitals during exercise can help us uh, immensely. So what are some common cardiovascular impairments? Some common cardiovascular impairments include deconditioning, cardiovascular pump impairment, orthostasis, gas exchange impairment, and peripheral ischemia. All of these impairments can be identified um, using simple measurements of heart rate, blood pressure, or those vitals and their response to exercise. Um, these are some simple strategies to keep in mind when working with patients post cardiac events and surgeries. However, home-based cardiac rehab uh, still has, there are several questions that need answered. There are several challenges uh, that we still have in front of us. One of the biggest one is that we still don't have any evidence on the high risk uh, patient category, right? All of the studies have focused on the low risk to moderate risk patients when it comes to home-based cardiac rehab. So, uh, so we don't have much guidance when it comes to these higher risk patients, uh, especially when you don't have access to remote monitoring. So there's also this um, possibility that patients, that clinicians or our physiotherapists will uh, rely on more. They'll try to take this easier route of giving less intensive exercise training uh, to be on the safer side. But we know that exercise will only translate into benefits if you give them optimal intensity. So if you give them very low intensity exercise, it's not going to translate into any benefits. So those are some questions that, that need answered. Um, and so we have some future directions. Um, obviously, uh, we are uh, we as physiotherapists are well positioned to overcome these barriers, and we have lots of exciting times for research. 
Uh, we need more clinical trials in the home-based cardiac rehab settings. We need to validate certain tests and, um, and yeah, and uh, think of strategies to uh, provide access to patients in these rural, rural areas. Uh, with this, I will, I will stop here and I will entertain any uh, questions. Uh, thank you, Shweta. Very well spoken about the home-based cardiac rehab. As I would say it is a need of the time because many patients don't attend our outpatient department because of the resources. Maybe most problem, the challenges comes is transportation, family support because there is nobody there to get them. And hence, if the cardiac rehab at home can be done with a good precaution and safety, it can reduce the burden on the cardiac. As we say, the cardiac rehabilitation has given good uh, evidence that it will reduce the new event. Hence, it can prevent the deconditioning also. And of course, what you say that by taking a simple assessment kit, we can uh, examine the patient and plan our cardiac rehab program. Thank you very much, Dr. Shweta Gore. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for this opportunity.